welcome to the third week of Advent. Today, we are looking at the word peace. Please stand with me as we read the verse together. It is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. Watch and listen for the word peace. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. He will rule over us. And he will be called Wonderful Advisor and Mighty God. He will also be called Father Who Lives Forever and Prince Who Brings Peace. Now let's do some worship.
My name is Kirk Jones, and welcome to Did You Know? Part of the show where I tell you things you may not already know. Today, we take a look at one of the most beloved and delectable parts of the Christmas season, and that is the food. Did you know? Gingerbread dates back to Greece in 2400 BC, which is basically when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Gingerbread houses, however, originated in Germany during the 16th century and soon became a beloved Christmas tradition. The largest gingerbread house ever recorded was in 2013 in the great state of Texas, no surprise. It required a building permit, covered 40,000 cubic feet, and was constructed out of 4,000 gingerbread bricks. Gingerbread bricks, yes. That involved a ton, almost literally, of butter. Did you know, one of the oldest Christmas foods is the fruitcake, dating back, well, a really long time ago. Fruitcake is found all over the world and has the ability to last a very long time before it spoils. 25 years, in fact. Fruitcake has also been to space, though December gives a nod, if not a bow, to the fruitcake by distinguishing itself as National Fruitcake Month. It's quickly followed by Fruitcake Toss Day on January 3rd. The town of Manitou Springs, Colorado, has become known for taking this day particularly seriously since it commenced its annual Great Fruitcake Toss in 1996. So, eat up folks, or toss, it's up to you. Did you know? Last but not least is the candy cane. Candy cane supposedly originated in 1670 when the choir master of Cologne Cathedral had candies made in the shape of a shepherd's crook. Today, more than 1.75 million candy canes are made each year for the Christmas season. Once again, I'm Kirk Jones. This has been Did You Know? And now, you do. Hello again, my dear counting friends. This time of year is my most favorite. One of the things I love the most is all the delicious food. Oh, like gingerbread cookies. You see, I have this plate full of tasty gingerbread cookies. Let's count them, shall we? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yum, 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 six tasty gingerbread cookies. Another very tasty treat I love is a candy cane. Let's count the red stripes on the candy cane, shall we? One, two, Three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, seven red stripes on this candy cane. My most favorite Christmas treat ever though is figgy pudding. I have made some for a special Christmas party I am going to at my cave. Let's count them. One, two, three. Very good, I made three figgy puddings. Fabulous job counting all these scrumptious Christmas treats today, my friends. I cannot wait to see you again. What did one snowman say to the other snowman? Do you smell carrots? Why aren't pine trees very good at sewing? They just keep dropping their needles. What always falls at the North Pole but never gets hurt? Snow. Why was the snowman searching through a bag of carrots? He was picking his nose. What do you call an obnoxious reindeer? Rude. Off. Rude off. What comes at the end of Christmas Day? Is it dinner? No. Hot chocolate? Yummy, but no. It's a Y. D-A-Y. All right, last one. What does a snowman eat for breakfast? Frosted Flakes. Okay guys, for today's game, you need three cups that stack into one another and two pieces of paper that are cardstock, which means they're a little heavier. And actually, I just had one piece of paper that I cut in half for me and one piece cut in half for Alexis. Now the goal of this game is to be able to stack your cups on top of each other but you have to be able to put a piece of paper in between 
because the name of this game is Yank It. So when you get them stacked, you have to be able to stand away from it without it falling. And then we're gonna yank the pieces of paper out and the cups have to fall back into their stack. And we're racing each other the whole time. Ready, set, go. Did Allie tell you about that living nativity she saw last weekend? Mm, no, she didn't. Okay. Well, uh, Allie, I'm sure Andy would love to hear about it, especially the part about the miniature donkey. Oh my goodness, it was so adorable. Mm. Yeah. Well, we aren't really talking so much right now. Mm -mm. Um, okay. So, um, what's uh, going on here? Well... We had a fight. Oh. About what? Well, it was really kind of dumb. We were arguing about which reindeer has the coolest name, and it got a little... Heated. Mm. Yeah. Well, you guys are right. That was a pretty silly argument. Well, it's fine now. Yeah. We decided we weren't going to fight because we know what today's word was going to be. Oh, peace. Yeah. yeah. So, we are being peaceful, and we aren't fighting. Yeah, no mm. fighting. Well, you guys know there's a lot more to peace than just not actively fighting with each other, right? Really? Oh? Yeah, like a whole lot more. You know, you guys want to learn about it? Yeah, it sounds like something I need for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Okay, well then let's roll it. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. Alrighty, so what have we learned thus far? That the Hebrew word for peace in the Bible was shalom. Right, which means? Whole or complete. Mm -hmm. You know, peace in the Bible doesn't just mean not fighting or not being in a war. It means being whole and complete. So a building could get shalom yep. or peace mm -hmm. once it's finished and has all its pieces. Yeah, or two people could get shalom after a fight when they fix their relationship. Mm -hmm. Or it could refer to someone's well-being, like how someone is doing. Well, that sounds great, but what exactly does this have to do with Christmas? Well, we were just getting to that part. You guys ready to tune in and see more? Yeah. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of Shalom, and his reign would bring Shalom with no end. 
a time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the apostle Paul can say, Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be, but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. I think I get it now. We can have peace with God because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Christmas is all about Jesus. Yeah, because it's when he was born. That's right. And you know, it's because of Jesus that we can now have a relationship with God that is whole and complete. It was Jesus' sacrifice for our sins that made a way for us to have a right relationship with God. Without Jesus, there is no possible way that we can have true peace in our lives. Yeah, and if we follow Jesus, mm -hmm. then we are supposed to be people of peace, creating peace with one another. Mm -hmm. mm, boy, we really messed that up when we got in a fight with each other, Allie. Yeah, Sarah, why did that happen? If Andy and I are both Christians, why did we still get in a fight? Good question, Allie. Well, you know, as believers, we are called to be obedient and do the things that God has asked us to do. But we're not perfect. And we all still make mistakes. And I think you guys both experienced that today. Yeah, yeah big for time. For sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, it takes hard work to be at peace with people. But the good news is, is the Bible helps us to understand just how we can do that. It does? It sure does. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians told believers to let peace keep them together, which, well, actually, you know, Andy, why don't you just read that verse to us? It's found in chapter four, verse two. Sure, it says, don't be proud at all. Be completely gentle, be patient. Put up with one another in love. Very good. Now, I want you two to think back to your disagreement earlier. You know, the one about uh, Rudolph versus Blitzen? Yeah. Okay. I want you guys to think if you had been gentle with each other, patient and humble, meaning that you were thinking of the other person more than yourself, do you think you still would have gotten in to that fight? No, mm. probably not. Yeah, it would have been hard to fight mm -hmm. if I was focused on being gentle. And patient and humble. Mm. Allie, I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me? I forgive you, Andy. And I'm really sorry too. I hope you'll forgive me too. Yeah, you got it. Aw, looks like you guys are experiencing some shalom right now. Definitely. Yeah. Hey, it's time for crafts. So grab your scissors and some paper because today we are going to be making some paper snowflakes. To make a paper snowflake, it's helpful if you start with a piece of paper that's already in a square. Now, if you don't have square paper or origami paper like this, you can use a regular piece of computer paper. And if you fold it like this, crease it along, and then cut off the top, you will get your piece of paper into a square. All right, so we're gonna now fold up our paper 
so that it looks like this, because this is the place where we want to start making the cuts for our paper snowflake designs. So here we go. We take our paper, we fold it onto itself into the shape of a triangle, and we're gonna crease it down really good like this, and then we're gonna fold it into another triangle by folding it over, creasing it down. Now this is a little bit of a tricky part because from here we wanna fold this into thirds. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna fold one side over and I'm gonna look at it and I want this side to be about the same size as that side. So I'm just gonna eyeball it and then flip it over and fold the flap back. So you can see it was like this. I fold one side, turned it over, and fold the other on it. And I like to cut off the top like this because that keeps me from creating a design where there's no paper. All right, I'm gonna get this last piece prepped and then we're gonna have our snowflake cutting party. Okay, so here we go. Fold it into a triangle, fold it over on itself into another triangle, and then make your thirds where we just kind of look at it and line it up as best we can, give it a good squish, flip it over on itself, and again, give it a nice good squish and cut off the tops. Whew. Okay, we're ready to get going. So you could take this shape and you could just start cutting out pieces and you will get a cool snowflake. You will get a fun design. But I thought for an extra challenge today, we could try some of these templates that you see. So let's try this one first. The way we do this is we're gonna cut out the areas that are in black. So I'm gonna look at my pattern, I'm gonna look at the snowflake, and then I'm gonna try and cut those patterns out. So here we go, I'm just gonna get started. I'm gonna make this pattern right here or this triangle. So let's see, hmm, kind of close, right? Doesn't have to be perfect because there's no two snowflakes on planet Earth alike. So feel free to make this as fun and different as you want. Okay, Whew. we got this one, we got this one. Now we just need this one down over here. So I'm gonna cut that out, cut out that triangle. And this is the best part. We get to see what it looks like. So we're gonna carefully unfold it and check it out. So this pattern made a snowflake that looks like this. Okay, let's try another one. So let's see. Let's do, hmm, <laughs> let's do this one. So I'm gonna cut it from this direction. So I'm gonna move my template so I can kind of look at it while I try to cut. Now I'm gonna cut this little pointy part at the top, then to make that first little leaf looking thing, I'm gonna come in from the other side and cut, pull that out, and then keep cutting. Now I'm just gonna look at that pattern and try and make it. And if you're doing the same thing and at any point you're like, oh my goodness, this is going a little wild, you can just make whatever design you want. You don't have to stick with this. Okay, so I've got those two pieces. Now I need to come down here with that big piece. That's the one I'm working on. I'm working on this cut right here. I'm gonna come down like that. And I'm gonna cut back up. Whew, it's kind of hard to get my scissors in there. All right, so we've done the top piece. I've cut out this piece up here. Now I need to cut out that right there. So I'm gonna take my scissors and I cut along. And then if you look at my pattern, the very tip of it is black. That means I'm supposed to cut that off too. You guys ready to see what this one looks like? Let's open it up. Let's check it out. <gasps> Ta-da! Okay, so this pattern made a snowflake that looks like this. Let's do one more together. All right, so here we go. This paper is a little trickier. It likes to slip around a little bit, but we're gonna do our best. So again, I'm gonna try and cut out the areas that you see that are in black. And I'm gonna start from this corner and I'm gonna cut down. So it looks like, it's like a little triangle kind of right at the top there. So I'm gonna try and get my scissors to go in there. And then when I'm making this part, I'm actually gonna cut from this side just so I can get to it a little bit easier instead of trying to wedge my scissors in. Okay, so then I'm again, I'm making that part right there. So I'm gonna cut like that, 
and I keep cutting down. And once you practice with this, it gets a little bit easier to figure out the best way and angle to go about making your cuts. All right, so I'm down to the very last part here. Cut there. And I'm gonna come over here and cut there. Whew. All right, let's see how close we are. I think we've got one more part to go. That's right, I have a little triangle that I need to cut out from right here, this part. So this paper is a little tricky. We're gonna just do our best. All right, pull these little pieces out. You guys ready to see what it looks like? Let's see. <gasps> Check that out. So this pattern made a snowflake that looks like this. So I hope you guys have fun making snowflakes and coming up with your very own patterns. Hey kids, you know what time it is? That's right, it's time for the review game. Are you ready? Here we go. Question number one. What is the Hebrew word for peace in the Bible? Is it A, provolone, B, shalom, or C, agape? The answer is B. The Hebrew word for peace in the Bible is shalom. Question number two, true or false? Shalom means whole or complete. Is this true or false? The answer is true. Shalom means that a person or a thing is whole or complete. Question number three. What are three things that help us to have peace with one another? Is it A, gentleness, patience and humility b ignoring pretending and silence or c nothing helps the answer is a putting up with one another in love being gentle patient and humble helps us to be at peace with one another question number four living in peace with one another is easy is this true or false which one is it, boys and girls? True or false? The answer is false. It takes a lot of work to be at peace with one another, but it's what we are called to do as Jesus' followers. Thanks for playing, everybody. As followers of Jesus, we are called to live in peace with one another. And the good news is that the Bible gives us these really practical tools that we can use to do that. You know, today, Andy and Allie learned that if we're patient and we're gentle, and if we're thinking of others more than ourselves, that goes a long way to helping us have whole and complete relationships with one another. But we also need to have peace within ourselves. We need to be whole and complete on the inside. But without Jesus, we can't do that. Without Jesus, we're broken because of sin. And sin is just a fancy word for anything in your life that you've done that's wrong. The problem with sin is that it breaks our relationship with God. And that's why we have Christmas in the first place. It's why Jesus came to earth as a baby, lived a perfect life, and then died to take all the punishment that we deserve onto himself. And because he did that, our relationship with God, it can be fixed. We can have our lives lived out as sons and daughters complete and whole. You know, even before Jesus was born, he was given the name Prince who brings peace. And even Jesus said, my peace I give to you. You see, that peace is available to each and every one of us. All we have to do is accept it. You know, if you have made that decision before, you've already decided to follow Jesus, in a little bit, I'm gonna pray, and you can just use that time to thank him for everything that he did for you. But if you've never made that choice, and you want to, if you believe that Jesus died for you and you want that peace in your life, you can say that prayer with me right now, today. So I'm gonna go ahead and pray. And you can repeat the words I say, or use your own. All right, let's pray. Father God, we know that we have sinned. God, I've sinned, and I know that I can't fix that on my own. Only you can make me whole and complete. And God, I'm sorry for everything I've done that's messed up my relationship with you. Will you forgive me, Father? God, thank you for sending Jesus to save me. I accept him as my Savior, and I want to live my life for you. 
God, thank you for loving me so much that you were willing to do whatever it took to repair that relationship and to make me whole and complete. Father God, I love you. In your name we pray, amen. Now I've got one more thing. If this is the first time that you've ever said that prayer or made the decision that you want to follow Jesus, I need you to find an adult who you know loves Jesus and tell them and ask them to help you on that journey. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly Oh!